Welcome to ConX, a leadership platform for construction executives. Today, we have Miss Virginia with us, and um, rather than me tell your story and tell the story of uh, your company, Virginia, why don't you, um, I know we've known each other for some time, but uh, I'm going to take a step back and kind of tell us, you know, start with yourself and, and tell us kind of your background and kind of where you started and, and what you do now. And, and, uh, we'll start from there. Sure. Uh, well, my, my name is Virginia Via and I am the CEO of West Pacific Electric. And I have been in construction for nearly over since 1991. Uh -huh. And during that time, we automatically, I was in grad school and um, actually was going to be a speech pathologist and was working with my husband and liked the construction industry. And after I graduated, I just decided I was going to continue to work in the construction industry, which I love. Um, we immediately started when we opened our business. We started in the federal sector. We never even touch the residential section, commercial section, we went right to the federal sector. Mm -hmm. um, with having said that, we did the majority of our work at Naval Air Station Lamar. And through that whole period, we became, um, our company had become 8A. There was a lot of opportunity and our specialty was high voltage electrical distribution. So we just started to um, travel on different federal sites and, and learn about how the whole industry worked as well as the SBA with the influence of SBA education, uh, how it partaked in our industry. So just a lot of learning during that time, a lot. So where did you, where did you grow up? Um, I'm a Central Valley. I grew up in Lemoore, California, again, a very small community. We are known for an ag base, but also we have one of the biggest naval air stations on the West Coast. And so it's just a combination of, of both. So um, very small town, but again, well, I, very uh, rich in ag. I spent, I was there in 90... 97 98 and uh, I wasn't impressed no I uh, yeah, I, was, I, I actually went there I was in Fountain Nevada and I went there briefly for a period of time to go visit some people but uh but uh, uh yeah it's it's not necessarily some a destination you put on the map or anything so unless you're going to go to the military base no, it, it's not. It's really known for ag base and the military base. We're so proud. We're so proud to have an ASMR there. And going to high school there, grammar school there, you know, a lot of our friends were military um, kids. So it, that was really the nice thing about it. Um, so, it, you know, it's such a good place to live. It was a great place to raise a family and very proud to be part of it. Um, so, yeah, that's, so, that's pretty much so what, what led you guys go to, I mean, you know, you guys do something that most people don't do and do it well, actually, is uh, you started in the federal market. A lot of people do, you know, commercial, residential, industrial, and then get into the federal market. Why did you guys immediately jump into the federal market? You know, that's a good question. Um, so we actually, at our church, we had met this lady um, her she was wonderful she was a procurement officer at nas lamar we became friends and she just indicated you know you really need to see the federal sector and i don't know if it was our ignorance or what we just thought well we could do this you know we were in our 20s and we thought why not let's just go right there let's do it and thank goodness they had the patience of job because um, we were not used to all the paperwork that was involved in the federal sector. You know, I can't even tell you the countless times they would call us and say, you know, the certified payroll, you need to come in. You really need to get this right. Your compliance paperwork. They were so patient at the contracting office at NAS for more that they made things easy for us. So we never doubted our decision to continue with federal work. So um, I guess if that would have went south, we would have probably ran quick, but we did not. We stayed the course and kept going with it and fell in love with it. I mean, it's just, it's a difficult 
it's a difficult industry, a, difficult, a very difficult sector. As I tell people now, if you do not like paperwork, then this is not the industry, the sector that you want to market. It's just, you just don't. You need to run and run quick. <laughs> well, you know, the, 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 the funny thing is that, you know, hearing your story, I just am reminded that um, between eight and nine, there's a percentage out of 10 um, companies that are 8As end up going, not graduating the 8A program and going out of business for numerous different reasons. But um, I think about like your experience there, that's kind of like the goal of an 8A program to, to kind of grow your company and help you, you know, um, so you become a resource for the government. Well, it's, it's been challenging. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. I mean, we, um, I was asked in 2016, I was asked by our congressman um, to uh, participate in a congressional testimony in Palmdale. And of course, of course, my first reaction was, no, thank you. I don't want to be part of it. And, you know, he was very persistent. Long story short, you know, I ended up participating in it with two other small businesses. And the title of the congressional um, committee was just basically asking us, what are the challenges we face as a small defense contractor? And I sat and listened to other people's testimony along with a lot of people in the audience had an opportunity to speak after. And it was very interesting because I'll tell you, Scott, it was, you were not alone. Um, and unfortunately, um, a lot of repetitive stories, a lot of good things, but a lot of difficult things and challenges that I really don't know how, as a small business, that we're going to be able to overcome them, uh, you know. So I'm um, kind of going off track here, but I, it, you, you need to go to one of those things to really understand that you're just not alone, you know, that there are others that are facing the same challenges same frustrations, but yet we're still committed to remaining, you know, federal contractors, DOD contractors, but a lot of challenges that we face daily, daily. So do you guys as a company and kind of backing up a little bit, I, I do you guys uh, strictly do GC work? Do you do GC and sub work? Do you do, I know that the times that we've worked together, you were more in the, you know, direct, you know, contract with the government, but what's the typical arrangement look like for you? Well, that really depends. So a good example is the job that we have you guys as a sub here at Vandenberg Air Force Base. This job specifically is with the Corps of Engineers. Um, we are a prime on this project. And it really just depends on how it's procured. And uh, we love going as a prime because you know, common sense will tell you you have more control. You have control over everything. We've had um, challenging times, to say the least, when we are a sub. So it's it's very difficult. We we prefer prime, but we will definitely go as a sub. And and that was one of the things that I brought up during that that testimony is that you give a price as a sub. And you may be notified that you were the parent low bidder, but then time passes and you're waiting for your contract and you're waiting for your contract. And they go back and they, you know, put it back out to bid or find somebody else who can do the job lower. And, you know, just a lot of frustration. And that's why I was saying I'm not alone in that because a lot of the contractors there, I would say 70% have similar stories because on the Department of Defense side, there is no FAR, there is nothing that really protects a small business for that, not to continuing to happen because that's, that's one of my frustrations with um, the sector that we're in right now because there's not enough protection in my, in, in my opinion, there's not enough protection for small businesses. How, uh, you know, electrical, why electrical? My husband, um, at the age of 16, just kind of got thrown into the oil fields. He worked for his stepdad, and he was kind of feast or famine, so he taught himself high voltage and never left, and he just, he was self-taught, um, 
And I tell you, he's one of the best in the industries. I mean, his work is flawless. Um, you know, almost OCD. Not, <laughs> and he's not, very not detailed. That, not that you're partial here or anything. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's really weird because I'm probably his best critic, which doesn't sound right. But his, but also, um, he's a perfectionist. And, and, and where I'm going with this is that it's, it's important. But what we're finding, not all federal sectors, every department of Air Force, Department of Navy, they're all different. And where he looks at a job that he can provide a better solution for the government, but they're not necessarily willing to pay, he'll owe, and if it's not that costly, and sometimes even when it is costly, he will make that adjustment. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we kind of differ, but I understand because that's his signature. You know, he's known for once he turns over the contract, the project to the owner, it, the maintenance is easier than what it's typically detailed on the drawing. So he sees it as the maintenance side. What will what will my what can I do for the customer to make it easier for them to maintain? So anyway, I mean, kind of going off a different tangent, but there's a lot of things with when it comes to electrical contracting. It's just something. He loves, I fell in love with it. Um, it's, it's a different industry because high voltage electrical distribution, a lot of people typically stay away from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understood. Yeah. Especially. For good reason, you know? So um, I, if you don't know what you're doing, you know, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. No, yeah, for sure. I mean, and he does not so much anymore because the department like of Navy, he typically, he used to um, maintain at NASLMR the 70 KV line and the substations for like seven years. Mm -hmm. It required for him to do a lot of hot work, a lot of hot work. Um, the industry or the department usually typically don't, for safety reasons, they really don't promote hot work unless you have to. But he, I can't tell you how many times he had to do a lot of hot work, hot work, which I try to not really focus on that when he's doing it, but he, yeah, he has it's, been a lot. It's, it's not a good thought. <laughs> I don't think no, no, no. Yeah. Oh, he, would, he would, you know, many times I would call them and he'd say, Hey, I need to talk to you about something. He would say, can I call you back? Cause right now I have this amount of voltage in my hand. So I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> you uh, later. What, what significant event do you think has shaped the business model that you have today? You know, because we, we chose to stay in the federal sector, I think that's changing. Um, I don't necessarily think there's one model, but obviously as the political um, administration changes back and forth, we've kind of learned to be cognizant of that. Mm -hmm. And so we've done a lot of work also in state for the same reason. So if we see the federal funds aren't going to be allocated the upcoming year, we shift over our, our sites more on the state level. So um, as that, that changes, so does our, our model, if you will, you know, because we just know that we need to change with it. We, we, we cannot just stay stagnant. When things change, we change. The, uh, how, you know, has you know the current events with uh, COVID kind of been a game changer for how you guys do business? And if so, how? Well, particularly on this project here, it certainly affected us because, again, in our our project, we had left what we had left what we call um, switching outages, uh -huh. and unfortunately, um, we understood it, but the government. Um, sent a lot of their people home. And so they could not support our outages. Therefore, literally stopped all our work. And we had, I think, 19 outages scheduled. We were supposed to be done by April 9th. Could not, we're still not completed because when we came back to start again, there was other outages that they had to incorporate at the at the job or at the base so we were even delayed even more so that's frustrating because um what we hear right now you know with with covid as far as the dod is concerned 
is that you may get, you're going to get days, but you're not going to get any uh-huh. overhead associated with that. So, um, and as you know, because I've been in contact with your, with Ross, but that's the frustrating. So it's absolutely affected our company. And then also projects going out to bid, there's been a delay at least over here um, because of job walks and, and the way solicitations are handled. So we've seen a lot of delays with work going out to bid. So it is definitely one of those things that I could not even have dreamt up. What what is <laughs> scary about all this is that that once this I won't say we use the word passes, but once we kind of are fully up and operational, it's not like all these projects go away. They just get, it just, the demand gets pent up. And before you know it, people like (laughs) me and you are going to have our hands full because there's going to be so many projects. I mean, I, I don't know how you were, Virginia. I think I know how you were before, but before this entire COVID thing happened, you were going like crazy. You know, I know we were. Right. And then right. all of a sudden stop for three months. That's a hard, that's a, that is a very difficult thing to do. Um, and then all of a sudden get start up and try to get caught up on everything that we had in the past, plus what we have coming in the future. And uh, I know that's, that's shaping a lot of different business models. I've been talking to a lot of people and it just seems like uh, how they were going to go about is going to be tough. One of them being, is how do you have the labor to do something like that? And the fact is you don't. So um, I don't know if you guys well, have that issue or not. Well, for us, we're actually blessed in that because we are signatory. So that is where we, you know, if, if we're not working, the guys sit down. Um, however, we kept them busy doing just other things that didn't require the military support, even though we were at the end of the job, you know, we try to keep them going. And so we are signatory. So anytime we rev up, all we have to do is put, you know, a call in to the unions and we are able to typically, I mean, usually right now you can get as many people as you need. So that's the nice part of being signatory. Um, it is just it's just, it's really difficult. I think, and I don't know as far as the work that you did, but like for us, um, the C1 project was design, build, technical proposal. And I think for the most part, we waited gosh, five, six months before we even knew we were awarded it. I'm hoping because of this, the COVID situation, that those time frames get smaller because as a small business, one of the biggest challenges I know we face is that you don't want to do too much work that you, you know, that you're not going to sure if you're going to get or not, and then all of a sudden get it, um, and then you can't handle it. And the same token, you don't want to think that you have a project and you don't bid on other work because you have something coming down the pipe, and then you end up not getting it. <laughs> it's really a, it's a, it's, it's a catch-22, and with this COVID situation, I don't know how they're going to deal with the abundant amount of work, like you said, that's going to have to come out because they're already budgeted for it. So I don't know how this is going to pan out. It's just a little frustrating. Well, and and until it does, it's people like me and you are just going to be speculating on what's going to happen. But uh, so so, uh, obviously things probably have changed for you, but does your company have a five-year plan, a 10-year plan or, cause I, being a business owner myself, I, you know, I put together a 10 year plan that kind of ties to my retirement, you know, cause in, in 10 years, I'm going to be near retirement age. And, uh, the, uh, it's terrible. It's crazy to think about that. But, uh, um, do you, have you guys sat down and, and thought through your plans in the immediate and in the future? And if you have, how has it been a change by everything that's happened? That's, that's an interesting question because my husband, we, we have six children and two of our kids um, you have to be work in our six work. children? Holy yeah. cow. Yeah, we've got five girls and one boy. And two of our kids have work for us or have worked for us. Um, and we just sent our son to line school yesterday. He's gone for five months to Idaho. But at, before COVID, we thought, well, maybe we have another 10 years and then he can take over. 
now COVID, we're like, we're not going to retire ever. We really feel that. We feel that. We will because here's the deal. We feel like our hearts go out to the people that are retired right now and find themselves coming back into the workforce out of financial necessity. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I mean, I don't need to tell you from the stock market to just the uncertainty of things. We just felt, well, we think we can continue to work until, you know, the good Lord takes us. As long as our kids step up and maybe take over more to where we have to do less. So really that's our new 10 year plan is just, enjoying life a little bit more and working a little bit less. But I, I can honestly tell you, as I sit here today, I don't see us. We, my husband and I just had this discussion. We don't see ourselves retiring. And that, that's, that's number one, that's scary um, for, for many people myself included. <laughs> and uh, number two, that, that is the reality for a lot of people. The only reason that, it seems to me like with all a lot of a lot of the friends I have that are in family owned businesses, and I don't know how old your kids are, but but uh, I have three of my four kids working in the company, and uh, uh, it's you know I, I most of the friends that I have that have, that have parents who are much older have done done kind of a slow transition, and they essentially have taken over. But my father. My father just he, he had a janitorial business and he just upped and up and died when he was fifty four, and I guess that's one of the reasons I want to have a plan is because I'm a, uh, I'm scared that hey if if I up and die I want to make sure not only my family taken care of but all my employees are taken care of too you know and it's a tough that's a tough one because can't really plan on death we know it's going to happen we don't know when it's going to happen though. Well, exactly, and that's why with our son he's been working for us for five years. And um, my husband just said, well, if you really want to do this, you know, the um, alignment, you know, he, he said, do it. I didn't get to do. And so he, like I said, he left this week and he's going to line school in Boise, Idaho, or Mer- Meridian, Idaho, I believe in, in any event. And so, so he can come back and then learn more the business side of it because we do want to scale it down because like you just said, we don't know when it's our time. Um, but, and I know it's probably me sound negative to you, but it's actually positive because we, we said, okay, we're okay with not retiring as long as we can just lessen our hours because we love what we do. And we don't know now with COVID and the way the world has changed, how much traveling we would really do now anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, no joke. So. Yeah. So we're kind of, you know, we, we have our first grandbaby. We, we're just kind of surrounding ourselves more with family. So at the end of the day, we just really, really, really love what we do. And I think we both would be saddened, my husband and I, if we didn't have, if we weren't involved in a, in, a, in a daily basis, even if we don't work, you know, 12 hours a day, 13 hours a day with this. So, um, and that's a decision we both made. We love what we do. And, and not to say that you don't, I, I mean, having a plan is important, but that is our plan to stay the same working. <laughs> well, and I think both of us have the same. Both of us have the same incentive there. I mean, because I think of people that work with me in the company as being like an extension of my family, you know, and uh, um, and so I, I want to make sure they're taken care of. That's the only reason, and it, that. Um, and my kids, it sounds like your kids are a little older than mine, but um, but how many kids do you have in working in your company? We have two right now, and, and I mean, their ages are from, tw- our youngest just graduated from TCU at, she's going to be 23, and then our oldest is 36, and then the other, I mean, all, I have five of them in their 20s, and then one that's 36, so um, two of them right now, they, they, you know, they've all graduated from college except for our oldest, um, she's uh, neurologically handicapped, so she's living with us, so it's challenging. The other one's we told them you can come to work for us, but it might not be what you want. And they decided to do other things for right now, which I'm actually glad. I want them to be happy with where they're at. Well, you know, that's a, the, the thing, you know, and, I, and it's interesting talking to people who have their kids that work work with them in the company. And me and my wife and me work, as you, you very well know, my wife is the CFO for our company. And, um, 
it can it can be for for me it has been extremely positive to have my family work with me and i'm trying to convince my kids and i was going to ask you how you convince your kids <laughs> and it sounds like you just let them com- come to that conclusion themselves um you know it was funny because my daughter was the first one she's 28 that wanted to she graduated from Fresno State business degree and she said, you know, I, I think I want to come to work for you guys. And I remember telling my husband, oh, I don't think this is a good idea. And he said, well, let's see. So I was leaving to Washington, D.C. I am a member of the United States Women's Chamber of Commerce. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, I'm going for four or five days. Why don't you come with me? And I said, sure, Mom. She thought this is going to be just a fun trip. So I took her. And one of the things that I didn't know we had to do is we had to go lobby. And so we went, oh, yeah. And so because she was one of the youngest ones in the group, she stood out. So they asked her to stand up, to come to the front, and they were going to teach her how to lobby. And she looked to me like, this is not what you said for us. (laughs) I had to do. (laughs) She did. So we went. It it, it ended up being an amazing experience for her because our congressman uh, had us go. The next day, he showed us everything. He took us to... Um, you know, he just took us everywhere. He was such an, an amazing host. And it was so funny because she left there like, this is not what you told me. I thought we were going to go shopping. I thought we were going to have a good time. But she left there so in love with the federal sector because we had a huge federal event where we had a market. And it literally was her first week working for us. And some of the customers, it was all federal customers, they said, well, who is she? And and they said, come up here, you know, talk to us. And she would just look at me and say, mom, help. And I'm like, no, here you go. I mean, you know, <laughs> so I really, yeah. So I thought when I, when we returned, I thought she was going to tell us, I just, this is not what I wanted to do. She absolutely at that moment just knew that's what she wanted to do. And uh, she's really good at it now, the marketing. But for the first six months of an outreach event, she would stand right behind me. And she thought she would, she was going unnoticed and, and, oh no, they would say, who's that hiding behind you? (laughs) And so (laughs) it's, I love it. I mean, I love, I'm, I really would love if all my kids or maybe one or two more would want to join in, but I, you know, I appreciate their decision and I understand it, but it's, it's nice to have kids involved in it. And you, you want your kids to do what they want to do, but you know, it's, it's, when you work with them, it's, uh, it's different. You get to live life with them, you know? And I think that that is, and plus for my kids, for me personally, it's given my kids to see that I am dad, but I am, a, I am also the, you know, the CEO of this company and for them to see me in a different context, I think has been helpful as they have grown up, you know? So I'm sure you guys see the same thing. Um, so my, my, I have my daughter is the only one who's not part of it yet, but I'm working on her slowly but surely. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, my my daughter, yeah, they like it. My son, you know, it's he works out in the field with my husband, so that's a little more um, challenging. Mm-hmm. And so, and my husband's very, um, like I said, he, he I, I laugh and I, I say he has OCD, but he's all into details, so he's all into quality, 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 and. My son learned very early that, um, yes, that may look good, that may be great, and that may be acceptable by the government, but that's not okay with me, so take it down, fix it right. So I can tell you that there's been some interesting nights when they come home from work (laughs) because um, I'm just like, oh, that's when pray, 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 because I'm just like, okay. (laughs) So, um, But at the end of the day, it's evolved into such a high respect for his dad that he decided, like I said, on his own, that he wanted to pursue being a lineman. So he says, I got to get caught up to him. And I said, well, good luck. <laughs> because <laughs> uh, When you start 16 and it's kind of like feast or famine, you have a different motivator. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> if you had to say, uh, if you had to give advice to anyone that would want to jump into, you know, maybe your specific sector or, or your specific business or who your clients are based on what you've learned, good, bad, and indifferent, what kind of advice would you give them personally and professionally? Um, you know, personally, just, I mean, obviously 
uh, I don't want it to be just professionally because I know the personal is a big part of, you know, what you do. And with you and your husband working together, I thought it would be interesting for our audience to kind of hear what you had to say. This one's, I think, fairly easy. So personally, which ties into professionally, do not, do not oversell yourself. I have gone to over 100 plus outreach events. And I have watched people oversell themselves because maybe they have a designation of 8A, head zone, whatever. And I've listened to clients say, well, we're looking you know, to build a high voltage line, okay, and another painter. Well, oh, we could do it. Um, and because, you know, in the federal sector, you don't have to have the classification. In other words, if, if you're a general contractor, you can build an overhead line if it doesn't require past performance technical proposals. So I think the best advice that I can give to somebody do not sell something you can't deliver because that will be literally the death of your company eventually. Um, I can literally say I've seen this probably 50 to 60 percent of the times and I just shake my head. So really stay true to what you know how to do. That's my first advice. Uh -huh. Not that you can't add things, but make sure you if they're deliverable. Make sure you can do what you say you can do because it will stay with you. Um, one thing that I'm really excited to share that I, my husband and I have done in our twenties, I mean, like probably any 20 year old, we were broke. I mean, we were starting a family, <laughs> we were broke. We took advantage of all the free SBA classes that there was the seven J program. And at that time it wasn't offered online. So you physically had to go and go to each meeting. Now you can get that information, which I can't emphasize this enough. It's so valuable, Scott. With that, we probably would have never stayed in the federal sector because it taught us so much. And we loved listening to success stories. Um, people came in, not just with the good, but they shared the bad, what not to do. SBA is definitely definitely part of our success is, is knowing that they're there to help us. Mm -hmm. That's the number one thing right there as far as education wise. So yeah, what about, that's what I would say. What about, you know, uh, you mentioned before, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, I think your company is interesting is because for people who don't know you and, and, and I'm not just, I'm not just saying this Virginia, but I really do believe it. Um, you're a very sharp individual. You know, and uh, and I say that because um, sometimes you ask me questions, I have to scratch my head and think about it for for a minute because <laughs> you're not coming to me with any easy questions, you know. And uh, I think it's interesting how, like, you say that because being a student of what you do is very very important. And it sounds for you, it's it's like a you, you know you take it on board as being like, hey, this isn't this is my responsibility is to stay a step ahead so that I can keep my company moving forward. Well, thank you for the compliment. You know, th and that's true. And, and I have to tell you, um, I don't want anybody to think listening to this podcast that we haven't fallen to our knees because we have, it's just how you get at who you go to, to help you. Um, those are the things that we learn. I'm, my husband says, I talk too much, and it's true, I love people. He, I love to learn. I love to share what I learn and what we find in our industry. I don't know about your um, experience is a lot of people don't like to share their successes because they're afraid that you're going to be their competitor. Uh -huh. I, on the other hand, love to share because I limit, I see life as very short, <laughs> and I think it's nice to be able to share our successes. Um, we even, you, you know, 10 years ago, I would have said I would have never teamed up with another electrical contractor on projects. I do now because I know my limitations in terms of financial capacity, um, workforce, uh -huh. past performance. And we've done that. And like on the C1 project, we brought somebody in as a teaming partner that enhanced our portfolio to get the project. And I think 
There's so much wealth of information, whether even if it's from your competitor, sit down with them, talk to them. But also know they're, they're probably going to be guarded. But um, I don't know. I like learning. I like sharing what I've, you know, I've experienced. Again, my husband's like, oh, maybe sometimes, maybe sometimes you share too much. <laughs> maybe so. I just like helping people. I just love helping people, and I love when people are successful, even competitors. It's nice to see. Now, kind of going to the to the last section of this, um, I have eight categories, and uh, I just want you to rank them on a one to ten scale. Ten being the most important, one being the least important. Now, they all could be tens; they don't compete against each other. So, um, so I, I just and if you want to give any comments related to why you gave a specific number, feel free. So, um, okay. so we'll start with scheduling from one to ten. Oh, 10. A 10. I mean, for us, and I'll just say this, I mean, not because I'm speaking to you. Um, in fact, we were reviewing for a job yesterday that we're bidding on, and we we're talking with somebody that we're going to be teaming with, and they had a scheduler, and I said, well, we have one, and I said, ours has really helped us, and I think if you do not have a good scheduler, and everything's affected, everything, from the potential TIEs to the R, you know, REAs to I mean, the job progression, period. That's a 10. That's easy. <laughs> Estimating. Equally important. I mean, gosh, that's a 10 as well. Because if you are not accurate or lowball something or miss something, it can close your business down. I think so it's very important. I have two here. One's is, one is contract, and then the other one is administration of that contract. So one is the actual physical document. The other is, like, the administrative side of every contract. Um, I wear a lot of hats, so I kind of do – you know, I, I think – you know, I, I'm looking at your list. I mean, I think that's a 10 as well. I think all these things matter. Um, I think without them – I think they're all just 10. I mean, especially those two as well. I think it's important to have a contract administratively correctly because, again, when I think about that, for me, it's working with, like right now we're working with the Corps of Engineering. If we didn't administer this contract the way that they expect, then everything else is going to suffer, including the, you know, the bottom line numbers. So that's really important. You gotta, you, you've got to have somebody in that place that really knows what they're doing. Well, you know, um, you know, I know you 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 uh, had looked through the list, and one of the items I have down there is uh, is accounting, and I wanted to see your take on it because um, I take it you're heavily involved in the accounting aspect of the company, also. I am. I do have a wonderful CPA that really I use her more than I probably should, um, and I, it meaning you know just because of cost, I do because in our because we, when we bid, it requires bonding. Um, I'm not a big fan of bonding because I think bonding is exactly that. It bonds you. It really ties you down. So a good accounting firm is huge because every year we have to give our reviewed financials and our bonding company gets that information from our accounting firm. And if the numbers don't look the way that we, you know, we uh, forecasted, then it's it's literally a very difficult situation because then they call you and you have to explain everything if there, if there, if there are overruns or COVID or anything that could affect it. So if I didn't have a good accounting firm, accounting itself I do in-house, but the accounting firm also is a big part of that, um, nothing else would work because then I couldn't go after the work that I need to go after. So accounting is number is ten. Also, it really is. Well, you know, the one of the one of my guests was David Dean owned Dean's Builds, and he said construction is unique because it's one of the few businesses you can go bankrupt and not know anything about it. <laughs> so very like, true. Very like, true. That's very very. That's very true. You know. So, very true. So, the, very the, true. The, the, I don't. I'm not too high up on bonds. I understand why the government does them, but I also think. To be honest with you, it's such a huge barrier for people that it, you know, it can be good for people who are in the market, but it can be bad because, I mean, I don't know how you guys are, but I can do a lot more than what my bonding says I can do, you know, and uh, 
um, it really is a is a, is a barrier. Unfortunately, I know I understand why they do it, but it is very difficult uh, to deal with. And, um, well, now after COVID, I don't know how this is going to really work because all markets, including bonding, any anything that has to do with financials, they've really tightened their belts. So what I'm finding is on work that we're bidding as said, um, bonding primes are asking for bond backs. Hmm. So, um, and so like, for an example, we're bidding on something and our bonding company said, okay, your civil is going to have to bond back because it's a large portion of the project. Typically, you wouldn't really get that unless you wanted it. Yeah. Unless you felt comfortable and you're not sure about this, this said that now the bonding company, at least ours, they're telling us that's just the market today is that um, they're really scrutinizing the job and the subs and their liability and the exposure. So, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not a bond bonding fan, but see, without it, for what we do, we have to have it. And I don't like it. I'm really not going to lie. So I'm sorry if somebody that's listening to this podcast is a bonding <laughs> rep. There's bond agents but, that don't like bonding. You know what I'm saying? So, I yeah, mean, uh, yeah, but, but, we just don't. That, that is interesting. It's bondage is what it is. Yeah, it, it is definitely. They got the right word there, but uh, but uh, that's a, that's an interesting take on. It. I'm I'm interested to see uh, what people do, knowing how bonding companies are, how they are very very uh, conservative in the way that they do business. That's interesting that they're requiring buy, to bond back you now. So. Um, well, that's, that's really all I had today for, for Virginia. I do, I always give my, uh, all my guests the last word. I do want to say, um, what I said before is the truth, Virginia. Uh, I, I, you know, there, I have to give you a lot of credit because number one, being a, a woman and, uh, not just a woman, but a woman who is the, uh, you know, uh, owner and, uh, and president of their company, um, it is hard in construction. You know, I got to give you a lot of credit there because people, a lot of people don't want to give you a, give you a break regardless of how much you know or whatever. And, uh, as, as I know, and as very well, you know, there's a lot about, running a construction company that has nothing to do with construction. <laughs> so, so, so I, I just want to comment that I, I have a, a lot of respect for you when people uh, ask me about other people I know um, in the construction industry and anybody that would stand out, I would always bring you up, Virginia, just because I have a lot of respect for uh, – when you ask me a question, it's actually a very – it's not an easy question to answer. It never is. I wish it was, <laughs> but you know, but but you've always do your homework, and you're and you're talking about continually learning. That's something that all my folks who who uh, have dealt with you, Virginia, over the years. Because um, I was thinking back, it's like how long have I known Virginia? It's probably been five, six, maybe seven years, um, and uh, we've done something together over that time. And I can't remember one question you ever asked me that was easy. So. <laughs> well, well thank you i think <laughs> no. so i want to give you the well, last word well, well i appreciate doing this because like i said i mean i'm a people person i like helping people um i love the fact i love the relationship that we have with your company i cannot stress enough like you said that you talk about who we are we also talk about who you are because there's things that yes you know, people probably can do their own schedules and whatnot. I don't think, I think people need to just really understand the importance of reaching out to the people that actually have companies that do what they do best. And that, you know, ACE Consulting, without the ACE Group, um, I rely on Roth a lot. And I really feel bad sometimes because I know sometimes it's after hours, I, because East Coast, West Coast. Um, but you guys, I'm very confident when I go to look to bid a project, knowing that I can always call you for field assistance, um, administrative assistance, you know, the plans that you guys wrote for me on this particular job, sailed right through. That right there is so important to me. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to thank you too for all your efforts because it does make our projects run a lot more smoothly. So well, thank you. Uh, 
Thank you for today. I, and I appreciate the relationship where we have, Virginia. You've always been a, a really good, uh, 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 always been good to work with. And, uh, and more importantly, uh, I'm glad there's people out there that are doing what we do and helping helping our, our troops that are doing it for the right reasons. And I, I've always felt like that about you guys, whether, no, regardless of what job you guys are doing, I always felt like um, it. I'm glad to have you guys in the market because you guys are honest, straightforward, hardworking group of people. And, uh, I can't say that enough. And, uh, thank you once again for, uh, for spending some time with us. And, uh, next week we'll have another construction executive on Connex.